the story that must be told. This one particular day when I came home from school, I, you know, I usually go home and practice. And I was playing music a little bit too loud. And my mom's came and banged on the door, boom, 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 boom. If you don't cut that music down, you're gonna have to cut it off. So while she was in the doorway, you know, screaming at me, I was still holding the record and rubbing the record back and forth. When she left, I was like, hmm. That was like, that's a, that's a pretty good idea. So when she left, I experimented with it, you know, a couple of months, a couple of weeks, different records. And then when I was ready, we gave a party, and that's when I first introduced the Scratch. When I was at Prairie View A&M, this cat named R.P. Cola who brought two copies of uh, Five Minutes of Funk by Houdini and Friends, and he just started cutting up the beginning of the, the Five Minutes of Funk. And he had the little felt pads and everything. Now, I'd already seen hip hop being done, like on, you know, there'd been footage, like that show Graffiti Rock. But to see somebody in Texas actually do it in my face at school was like, you know, I was like, oh man, this dude was actually doing what I've seen on TV and stuff, and he's actually making it come to light at Texas. And I stepped to him and was like, yo, man, you gotta show me how to do that. <laughs> scratching thing, that's always the first thing that we usually grab somebody. How the hell are they doing that, you know? So it's like, that was me. How are they doing that? So I grab my mom's whatever record, Joan Baez record, and I'm scratching it on the turntable, tearing the shit up out of it, you know? And, and she's not home, so thank God, you know? But she comes home and there's grooves all beat to shit and the record's all busted. <laughs> My dad used to hide his needles in these attache cases that my mom had. And um, he would hide the needles there and lock them up. And my brother would pick the lock and take the needles out and stuff like that and set them up on the turntables and call his friends over. And his friends would just bring massive records, like crates of records and stuff like that. And they just make tapes, you know? They make um, all kind of mixtapes with his friends rhyming and my brother DJing, cutting up beats and stuff like that. And, that was my first exposure to the whole art of DJing and hip hop. A lot of people get rap and hip hop mixed up. It's two totally different things. When you say rap, you say an MC and a DJ. When you say hip hop, you say graffiti, you say break dancing. You say DJs, you say MCs, the way you dress, the way you talk, all the elements into one. That's hip hop. This is the famous Browns River Houses, the home of hip hop. We also we used to say the home of God, and also little Vietnam. It was crazy at one time with even the police when they were coming. We had a lot of gang violence happening at the time. Uh, also a lot of social awareness that was also happening at the time. So that's why we started Universal Zulu Nation, trying to take a lot of gang affiliations and turn it to something positive. Bambada was one of the heads of the Black Spades. You know what I'm saying? He was the division leader. And it was taken from a concept of Bambada went to Africa when he was leaving the spades and he seen how the black people were living over there and you know he adapted this because he said when i go back i'm gonna start the zulu nation we started organizing a lot of the different people in the street you know who had different dance groups b-boys b-girls as well as um rappers and graffiti artists all together to make the whole culture it evolved from us beating each other up to like break dances i used to break dance myself back before crazy legs before all them cats y'all got the moves from me you know it Let's dance. 
I guess it was 73, and uh, a lot of these DJs, they were basically uh, playing, you know, kind of like a disco club type of thing, you know? A lot of stuff that was being played on the radio, a lot of popular stuff. And out of all of that came this rebel, Cool Herc. He wouldn't play that main album cut. He would play a break from a song inside the album, so it was like beats and rhythms and, you know what I'm saying, his style was, he was like God. The break beat is that part that you look for in a record that let your God self just get wow. And then as soon as that break beat leaves, you're saying like, ah, oh, it's only a minute, it's only 30 seconds, you know, you want to hear some more. So that's where the hip hop DJs came in and started making that beat, that break beat, that stripped down funk span longer and longer for you could just get crazier and crazier and crazier on the dance floor. So that inspired me right there. I was like, okay, I got this 15-piece uh, drum set upstairs that I took for since I was eight years old building up, you know what I'm saying? Now I gotta make room for some turntables. One day I'm upstairs, bam's turntables dropped, broke. So Aziz, who was one of the original members of the Zulu Nation, he's like, yo, man, Bam needs your turntables. Before he can get the words out of his mouth, I ran in the room, packed the turntables up. And I was at the door like this. Where Bam at? Put his turntables down and let him get on, and he started rocking the house, and, you know, and came one of our little protégés in the family. Yeah, Jazzy J, Red Alert, Grand was Dead or DST. All of them had their different characteristics that just blew up the turntable. The DJ was the, the source of the energy because it was his responsibility to find the, the music, uh, the selection of music, the what type of rhythms that the people would feel in the audience. And there actually were no MCs, it was just the DJ. We would never get on the mic and start saying a rhyme. The only time we would pick up the microphone is when we would say, um, if he on the green truck outside, please move it, or, 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 or Jerry, your mother's at the door. And it was a DJ who had to uh, give the rights of passage to the MC to even pick up a mic at, at his set. I was walking down the street, just a humming to the beat, and everybody else was a doing the freak. Then they asked me about another MC. I said a wimp and a wham. I don't give a damn. Look like a jelly, but they call it a jam. You know? <laughs> the MCs were just more or less there to get and get the people involved. Like we would create the crowd participations. You know, all the hoes say ho. You know, anything that had to do with the crowd was where the MC, the master of the ceremony, got involved. The DJ was the backbone, and we were the arms, the legs, and everything else to make him colorful. And they say the big DJ race, their door is running in first place. From the left to the right, he's out of sight. From the right to the left. If a person wants to get an understanding of how hip hop was back then, the best thing is to look at Wild Style because, you know, that was how it was done. You're not going to get to see Grandmaster Flash, you know, cutting in his kitchen. That wasn't like part of, you know, somebody wrote a skit or something and said, well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have him put his turntables in the kitchen. No, they were in the kitchen. A lot of the clubs further down in midtown Manhattan, they never wanted to book no, no MCs or DJs. As time went by and they found out that we were making money, that's when they started booking us. Things started being pushed, getting pushed more downtown. That's when a lot of the punk rockers started coming up hanging with us and partying among black and Latinos, where everybody thought it was going to be some type of racial violence and this and that. But as Uncle George Clinton said, one nation under groove. We interrupt this record to bring you a special bulletin. The reports of a flying saucer hovering over the city have been confirmed. Hip-hop. 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 I think like 82 maybe was when the grill opened up on 3rd Avenue down around 10th Street. And I saw a tiny little ad in the Village Voice that said the Cold Crush Brothers were going to be at Negril. And I went down there with my girlfriend at the time, and we walked in, and it was a basement club, and I could hear this enormous, loud beat happening, like boom, 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 boom. And I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. 
So I, I gave him the money, and I went down the stairs so fast, I think she was flying behind me like a flag in a cartoon. You're like, woo! And, and I said, oh, yeah, man. I was uh, you know, standing there at the edge of the dance floor, and there were like a couple of Japanese business guys who seemed to be everywhere in hip hop at the beginning. You know, they're standing around there. They like always know where it's at, you know? And me and my girlfriend, you know, I said, this is great, huh? She said, well, I think I'm going to have to have like a drink. And I went over and bought two of them. I said, here, here you go. Just have them both. And because and I was like, I, it, I, I didn't even, I didn't, need, I didn't need the drink or anything. Man. I was just like, you know, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Because there's nothing in this music that I don't want to hear. There's words that are kind of syncopated and rhythmic, and there's this hot drum track. It's great. This is music I've been waiting all my life to hear, and I didn't know it. We felt so attached to this because this, was, this wasn't just something that we did for the money. I mean, we believed in this. I mean, when I left, I could play for six, seven hours outside, and when I came home, I set my turntables up and I played for another six, seven hours, you know what I'm saying? It was something I had to do. It's history and a lot of people don't really uh, understand what actually happened then. Because there's the pre-rap record hip hop before people were rhyming on records. When Rapper's Delight came out, it got into the era where uh, the rappers didn't need a DJ. As long as they have a drum machine on the side, you didn't need a DJ. And a lot of record companies wanted to just pay the rappers and not pay the DJs because the rapper's voice is on the record. So what do you need a DJ for? DJs are the ones that put the MCs out there, but then the MCs became the power. A lot of MCs got away from the, the cultural part and got into all about the Benjamins, and um, they left the DJ behind. It took a lot out of hip hop in my heart, you know, because I was one of the rappers who liked to rap to my DJ's feeling. You know, if he felt good, I felt good. And my music was sounding good because he was sounding good and vice versa. But then when it was a that, it's like you're rhyming on a flat line, not a heartbeat. We're just three MCs and one DJ. And we can get down with no delay. The next master mic and what you got to say. Buffalo gals, Malcolm McLaren. All the scratchings making me itch. Zigga, zigga, zigga. Where's that sound coming from? The zigga, zigga. What is that sound? So one day I turned on the TV. I seen the Grand Mixer's DST live in concert with Herbie Hancock. Oh, that's where that zigga, zigga sound comes from. Is that turntable moving back and forth. And then I knew that's what I'm going to be one day. It was just so futuristic at its time. Who would have thought? I mean, there's people playing the trumpet, drums, but I just knew that this is something different. Hey, I want to move the record back and forth in my own way. Actually, I couldn't afford turntables at the time, so I bought two tape decks. I used to record Halloween spooky sounds or space sounds from 1999, and I would mix off two tape decks. And that's why I got my name, Mixmaster Mike. Mike really communicates with the soul of the solar system. <laughs> and he really, it, he and, and a few other, not just know about the aliens, they have the knowledge of having been there. You know, in other words, he knows about Earth because he's here and he's moving around in those stratas just trying to show the Earth people what's going on. But that, he's, he's, he's truly a Zectarian. <laughs> I got inspired one day because down from the apartment complex was a football field. And I seen these three lights that landed on the field out of my window. I kid you not. And that's where I got inspiration to like, hmm, maybe it was my scratching that caused these light beams to come and land. Maybe they're visiting and maybe I am actually communicating to intergalactic beings. <laughs> I 
I grew up listening to a lot of jazz and funk, and I wanted to be a part of that movement in, in another way instead of just being a listener. Robert Johnson, the Delta Blues. All right. So I got here. This is life-size Cubert. As you can tell, my super physique outmatches this man right here. <laughs> I used to DJ garage parties and stuff, and um, there'd be some times where I'd do the same garage in other months, and I'd see this kid pop up every now and then, and um, it would happen to be Cubert. He would like approach me, like, yo, I dig what you do, Mike. So I said, well, I'll show you some stuff when I come to my apartment. He'd sit there and just watch me practice the whole day. Then in between my practices, he'd ask me, how do you do this? Can you do that again? My advice, do not show this guy your scratch that you found and developed, because he will take that and understand it so much more than you have. You know, he's like the Louis Armstrong of scratching. You know, even everyone tries to dress like him, except me, though. You look a lot better. One day, everyone's going to try to look like Yoga Frog. But for now, we got this guy, the one and only DJ Cubert. <laughs> This is a fader, uh, so you can just, what it is, is just on and off. You know, that's all it is. It's kind of like talking, you know, you just, you just speak what you're saying, you know. The more, the more uh, techniques you know, the more, it's like each technique is a word. And so the larger your vo vocabulary, the more articulate you can speak. Farts. Burps. Beat juggling is the uh, live manipulation and remix of music right before your eyes. Um, usually what you do is kind of, you kind of use the same two records. So this is like, you, I'm just using a piece of the record, it's called the break. It's like, and then this is the same record as well. Like that, right? The fader is like for that turntable and that turntable, right? And in the middle is both. So, if you mess with both of those beaching them. I've always been into music ever since I was, a, I was a kid. My mom even said when she would play music and I would be in her stomach, I would kick and stuff. And, and I can't sleep unless there's music on. I was like a, a D minus student. I totally hated school. And I, I always would go home and just do music. <laughs> I had a little turntable when I was a little kid. It was, it was uh, one of those uh, Fisher Price turntables, and I I, uh, I used to play it backwards and stuff when I was like uh, I don't know four or five years old. And I would, I would always say to myself, Wow, I wish I could record my voice and put it on record, and see what it would sound like if I played with my played with my played with my, if I played with my voice. Now you, now you be a DJ. Scratching really came to me when uh, when I heard I guess Rocket. DST was the first one to use that sound. You can gauge a DJ's skills by when they use that sound. It's kind of like uh, if you can gauge a guitarist's skill if they just use a plain acoustic guitar and see what they could do with it. You know, so this is like the plain sound right here, or this one. Scratching is like um, to me, it's like some other kind of intelligence. <laughs> Me and Cuber used to practice. That's where we made up the question and answer. I'd, I'd scratch the question, and he would give me an answer. And so we didn't even have to talk to each other for a whole day. I remember one time he moved away. 
to another city. And I was like, damn, how am I gonna, how am I gonna bite it? How am I gonna, uh, you know, how am I gonna get his ideas? So I imagined all these, like, uh, like DJs from outer space, like what would their style be? He took that and um, just like went in his own world with it. Since Earth is like, a, it's like kind of like a primitive planet, what about the more advanced civilizations? How does their music sound? So I would imagine it, you know, whatever they're doing. And uh, I guess that's how I would come up with my ideas. the bulletproof scratch hamsters uh changed our name to the space travelers and, uh, why is that we changed our name because of dj mars and uh we don't give a fuck actually In the mid '80s, everybody was a mobile DJ. Yeah. When you, went, you were a mobile DJ. Yeah. I mean, everyone in high school, everyone had their crews, and you'd bring your whole system, and everyone would play for half an hour, and whoever like rocked the crowd the best was, you know, like the winner. Lowrider, yeah. car show, YMCA, corner store battles. You know what I mean? School DJ yeah. battles, block parties and shit. You know? For real, man. I used to do parties, and uh, the motherfuckers would want to take my turns. You know? But that never happened, did it? It was all about battling. You know. It, you got the b-boy battles and and totally the dj battles and stuff and everyone would would kind of get together or or you would even go to someone's house even if they just did a party in someone's garage where they'd open up the door and it'd be like eight people sitting around smoking weed <laughs> <laughs> I remember going by Eddie Death's house all the time, and he'd be down in this little room that got all sweaty. Just scratching, scratching, scratching. Make it a little warmer. If you're doing something and no one even gives a fuck about what you're doing, and you're just doing it in your bedroom for yourself, like how you really feel, it's like a painter just going crazy. That's what happened, and that's why they would come up, like, say, the tones, go, this really is cool, you know? And it wasn't like thinking, well, will this work at the club on Saturday night? It was just, let's just do it. It sounds good to me and to these two other people in the room with me. were the first to take the secrecy out of DJing because a lot of hip-hop DJing was based on covering the label so that nobody knew what you had, not revealing your tricks. And I think the Pickles were the first people to just be like, hey, here's exactly how to do what we do. We want you to go out and do it better so that we can learn from you. That to me was like, a, it took, that was a giant step forward. And they were so far ahead of the time that, that people, a lot of times crowds would just be like, damn, 
They won battles. That's what they did. And that's why they became so well known. I mean, they're incredibly talented, but that was something that sort of put them on the map. What made it unique was we all had our own individual styles. I was in the like scratching horns and Q had this drum. I was just scratching some drums practicing and then Mike comes in with the horn. I don't know, he just walks in the room and says, ooh, and he started scratching with a horn and from there Apollo came in and he said, whoa. Apollo came in with the trumpet stab and that's how it started. We looked at each other while we were doing it. Sounds like a band, right guys? Yup. Sounds like an actual band. <laughs> We felt totally like this. This is it right here. We're doing something different than everyone else. Yeah, we were totally like on a on a, another branch of hip hop. I guess in the early '90s, there really weren't DJ songs on albums anymore. Um, and actually, a lot of rap groups didn't really even have DJs anymore. That's the scene that we were we were like totally not into, we were totally just all DJ kind of band and stuff, you know. I mean, we love, we love the rap and stuff, it's just that what they were doing with the DJs in the background and they were just to fill in stuff, I was like, yo, this, this, this is not, we just totally blocked it out and it was just, we were in our own world, we were like on Jupiter or something. But when David Paul came, he was like, yo, let's make an album, just a DJ album, no MCs, just y'all shining. They were like, uh, all scratch an album, what are you doing? <laughs> Return of the DJ. Oh man, it definitely opened some doors and it opened our minds. Up until the, the return of the DJ album, my goal was to DJ for a popular rap group and be on stage with someone and, 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 and be in videos and stuff like that. I never thought that I'd end up having my own album and that I'd be able to exist as a musician without the presence of an MC. And Return of the DJ was like the start of that. Start up the phonograph. You're in Jackson Heights, Queens right now, and that's basically where I was born and raised. I'm Spanish. My, my parents are both Colombian, and at an early age, I was exposed to music like salsa and merengue and stuff like that. During the early 90s, you had club DJs, house DJs, radio DJs, mixtape DJs who did mixtapes and stuff like that. We were like, yo, we want to have a, a, a concrete, specific identity, which I think Babu was like the first person to actually even use the word turntable. I told him that and he go, you know what, man? I'm not even going to call myself DJ Babu anymore. I'm just going to be called, like, J. Ru calls himself the damager. I'm going to be called Babu the turntablist. And and that's what it was. It was something I'd write on my mixtapes. It was something I, I named myself. So then it, all of a sudden it just went, <laughs> Just scattered, you know. He draw he dropped it a few a few places here and there. Yeah, we're turntableists. To me, the original turntableist is Grand Mixer DST. Not only was he an integral part of the song and the band, he was like the highlight. The turntable is a musical instrument as long as you could see it being a musical instrument. You're dealing with notes, you're dealing with measures, you're dealing with timing. You're dealing with rhythm. It's just, you know, different tools, but the outcome is the same, music.
from scratch and all night Hey DJ just play that song you have me itching Up with Rocco. What? <laughs> Mr. Sinister representing the execution is from Queens, New York. Word. 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 Representing Brooklyn Total Eclipse. Rob Swift. Rob, Rob, Rob Swift. Fuck Raider. Fuck Raider. Fuck, fuck, fuck Raider from Manhattan representing the X. The fuck? The fuck? Sometimes you just bump into different things that might sound good. Like, that's what it is, it's freestyling. So right now, we was freestyling. We doing one thing that sounded really good. So we figured we could probably incorporate it into something else that we're doing. All right. You know? All good ideas happen by accident. Bro. Those three were good. Just go for the left. After the third one, you gotta do the end. <laughs> the last one. The last brown brown yeah, filling, right? Thing. To do the last. What you do? Just do. Do it. Brown brown brown. Do it. Brown. No, like how you. <laughs> no, nah, how you said. Brown brown brown. Do it. Brown brown. 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 So what we're trying to figure out is how to record music in a way that'll come off similar to to the way a, a regular band would play music. So um, it start. It could start off with one kick and snare, and it'll evolve into something big. Welcome to Brooklyn. You guys can come in. This is basically a rub, so it'll be fur, 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 fresh. It's a tool. It's a method of transcribing scratches. It's helpful if you're trying to convey your composition to someone else. When I started doing that, I brought it to the DJs, uh, Rob Swift, Babu, and they're like, oh, this, is, this works. So then I felt, okay, I got to develop and develop, and that's where it is now where we got this little booklet. This is a routine that Rob Swift did. If you follow along here, it's scratch, chin, 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 scratching, boom, scratch, chin, chin, boom, scratching, boom, what is it? What this is all about is the art of mixing. It's, it's analog, it's, it's right in front of you. They, they don't need a delay line, they're creating delays with beat juggling or with moving the fader in certain ways to stagger things and to, and to, and to, and to stutter things and to manipulate time with your hands. My dad's a professional musician. He wrote the Have a Coke and a Smile jingle. I don't know if you remember that, but... Um, so I get a lot of my musical background from that. I had like a traditional music upbringing. I was always in the band. I played piano and drums and started drums when I was seven. And just um, all through high school, marching band, snare drum, I can read music, I played trumpet. But with the scratching, I had just heard like, wicky wicky, you know, like really easy, simple stuff. I was like, oh, anyone can do that. But then I saw him and he's like doing all these crazy tricks and all these patterns that some I can't even play on the drums. And I was just like, oh my gosh, I gotta learn how to do that. And he pushed me and a month after dating, he moved in and we've been together for the last four years. The turntables moved in with him and I stopped making fun of it. The first time I heard uh, 
scratching, really. Um, uh, it probably was like Rocket. It was just like so different and, and just such a weird sound. <laughs> It was hip hop and it started like you know when it started but my mom had the actual records and hip hop just showed me how to play those records see it's two of them circle circle i don't have a mixer <laughs> and when i bought my first set of 1200s i looked at i woke up the next morning and I, and I looked at them and i said oh no what did i just do i just spent a whole lot of money on turntables and then as i began to gaze at them i said wait a minute i can make this work and I read some theory book, uh, but they said if you practice for one year and give up everything, women, wine, song, uh, everything, you give it all up, you would be the best at what you do. And that's basically what I did. Day in, day out. When I go to work, he's getting ready. When I come back from work, we're still practicing. When I go to sleep, still practicing until I say it's enough, that I can't take any more. <laughs> Or else I'll break the needles. <laughs> okay? I'll break the needles and then you can't play anymore. Watch out. Steve D, Johnny Cash, and Sean C. Like, we used to all hang out together and we used to go up to Steve's house and practice. And we started going with Steve to these battles because at the time, like, Steve was like the illest person out of us. All the wheels of steel, he. All the wheels of steel, the wheels of steel, he is. All the wheels of steel, he is. Steel, he is. All the wheels of steel, he is. Steel, he is. All the wheels of steel, he is. Steve D, the founder of Beat Juggling, and Steve D helped me realize that once you think you've reached the limit as an artist to what it is that you do, once you believe that, someone's gonna come along and prove you wrong. Battling, b-boying, you know what I'm saying? That's where it all came from. That's where hip-hop came from. From being, you know, competitive and from, like, trying to, like, knock the next guy down and trying to be the best. But it's all fun, you know what I'm saying? It ain't, like, real beef. Hip-hop is asking you a question, you know, and that question is, what are you going to do? So if that person is, is considering himself hip-hop, as far as battling or being a DJ or what have you, he's asking you that question, and it's up to you to answer it. And if you don't answer it, you lose. Isn't competition kind of like part of the American way? You know what I'm saying? Like, aren't we all kind of um, raised to compete in the world and to get ahead the next person? All the time. I'm competitive with, with anything. You know, I, I want to be the best at whatever I can be. Uh, if it's drawing a straight line, I want to be able to make the straightest line. Because, you know, growing up in Harlem, you know, you have to be tough that way. Understand, this is the motherfucking DMC! U.S. Finals! Somebody gonna leave here and go represent for the U.S. DMC stands for Disco Mix Club. It was a house music competition. And then um, DJ Cheese from Plainfield, New Jersey, who's the 86 world champion for DMC, when he entered that year, he introduced scratching into it and changed the whole battle. And they went along with it and let it be a hip-hop battle. DMC is like you do a six minute routine and you try to make that six minute routine the best overall. You know what I'm saying? You're not really going up against one guy. You're not trying to like battle this one guy. You're trying to battle everybody. We did 12 heats this year. 
and they all, you know, managed to win in their own cities or, where, or other people's cities and uh, came out to battle. So it was, everybody was almost a first timer. <laughs> Day, DJ, it was mostly like, you know, you'd mix, you know, if you could mix two records, you know, just blend records, you were cool, you know, and you, you might have like a little, you know, double beat here and there, and then scratching came along, and that was the big thing, you know, scratch, oh, if you could scratch, wow, you could scratch and mix, wow, that's and pretty good. And if you good. could transform. Yeah, yeah, if you could transform now, wow, yeah. wow, that's another plus, but then it took, it just went bananas when people started beat juggling and then flaring and, you know, just crap. Then after that, then came body tricks. When I won the TMC World Final, Rob was like a big time help to me right at that point. Like I used to come into his house, practice, just put my set together like we were just putting our song together. We just were like, hey, it would be dope if you do this at that point and just a lot of input, a lot of help. <laughs> You could watch a videotape and not realize how much time and energy was put into those six minutes. Months and months of practice, you know, go all boiled down to six minutes. Once you get in front of the set and it's like, you're going to compete against him. Uh, I'm not his friend anymore. I can care less. I'm going to eat his kids. <laughs> you know, you got to try to act like you're the number one, but it's all an act. You know what I'm saying? Inside, you know, I get nervous. You can do your routine 100 million times in your room. You get in front of like 500 hardcore hip-hop fans expecting to hear something. Mm -hmm. You can crumble Anything pretty can fast. You can be DJing and scratching, your record skips. skips. Oh shit. Yeah. You can go to like move the pitch control, your arm hits the needle. Oh shit. Oh, oh shit. shit. Oh, 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 oh shit. <laughs> interesting ones, uh, Mysterio, Snake Eyes, you know, the ones that come out bugged out, they're not afraid to look different or do anything different. Competition is a way to get seen. As opposed to just DJing out in the street, in the park, you know, you get to reach a wider audience. The winner from tonight, he goes to DMC World Championships and battles through the eliminations to see if he places, which usually US DJs do place. And uh, then he'll eventually go up against Craze. When I was competing, I would be, um, I want to be the best, you know, I want to I want to learn all the tricks and put it together and put mines on top of it and flip everything, you know. And then I guess now I'm more like of a soul searcher where I, um, I kind of try to outdo what I did yesterday. 
and kind of just do it for the love without competing against anyone else but myself now. They just get over it. It's so stressful and it's too much. It's too much to like stress all year planning the routines. Even Craig said it, you know, after this third time he's done, whether he wins or loses. And 20 years from now, I want to look back and I want to be like, yo, I had fun when I was like 20 and I was doing all this crazy shit with the turntables and stuff. I don't want to look back and be like, yeah, man, I was representing. I was keeping it real. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to, you know what I'm saying? I'll, I'm having fun. And that's what it's all about. Let's see here. Who you want to pick a card? Any card? No, no, nah, let me just see. Let me see. I got Rex in effect. I played with Dougie. That's my first playage. And then Toshi Nobu, Kubota, Toshi for short. Then there's Guy, Luke Skywalker, both times with Two Live Crew, Black Street. It's all fun um, when you DJ with a group because you get to showcase you. If you ask some of the turntablers, you know, um, what groups you DJ for? Huh? What group? You know what I mean? And it's like you can't tack any medals onto the, the trophy that they may have that's right. sitting there. It's like they didn't go any further, you know, and I think that they need to get, um, if they want to elevate the art form, it has to be um, in a, in a, on a bigger platform. You know what I mean? With uh, whether you're performing in the studio or performing with another kind of artist, just take it there. I got my first drum at five, and then I started playing on a set at 11, 12 years old, somewhere in that range. Then I got into turntables, or then I got into beat making, then I got into turntables, but I don't know how to play anything, you know, I don't know how to play the piano. Anything melodic, I don't know how to play. Turntable was originally something you walked away from when you put a record on, you know? You never thought to sit there and look at it and say, what else can I do with this? You're, not supposed you, to, you're never were supposed to touch it. Yeah, it was so... You know, your parents were like, don't touch the turntable. Yeah. Don't touch the record. You're going to ruin it. I was 11 years old, and I heard Rocket um, by Herbie Hancock. The DST scratching on it, it was ship, ship, shrut. And I grabbed the shrut. That sucks. Yeah. Jurassic creates songs with each other. We go about it in different ways. A lot of times, Cut or I will have a beat, and we will come to, to the table with a beat. Are you guys feeling this? Yes or no? Sometimes they're in here writing it. Sometimes they write on their own. Sometimes they write together. There's been tracks where the beat's been playing in the studio while everybody's just vibing out, just talking. There's times when we don't really have the rhyme or the guys don't really have the rhyme together and they lay down this mock track just to see how it goes, just to get the patterns and the, you know, the fluctuations and everything. Go back and fill them with the words so I can go later back and program it around what they're doing. It's fun, but it's always a challenge. Y'all know Babu out there? Yeah. My people's on the right, y'all know Babu? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, 
For this era right now, I guess, for what the media has portrayed as rap music has been very limited. And I think with Dilated, we just brought it back to the basics. I mean, the reason that I even connected with Evidence and Rocka was because they didn't want a DJ for. For, for, for fake reasons. They didn't want someone up there. You know, they could have anybody if they just wanted a stage prop DJ. But they themselves are very involved in, the, in all the elements in the culture of hip-hop. They both started as graffiti writers and applied those same mentalities to their emceeing and evidence also as, as a producer. So their respect for the DJ is, goes without question. You know, so for me to be involved in any aspect of the group, whether it's recording, on stage, interviews, anything like that, you know, they totally include me as a complete third of the group. And it um, feels right. This is a show vinyl I put together for the, for the Beastie Boys, and I put like drum hits before each name, so it sounds like. start scratching some um, some roosters for no reason. <laughs> Just totally flip them out. You know, it's like I'm their maestro and it's like whatever I throw in, they have no choice. They have to rhyme over it. Come down into the dungeon. This is basically uh, most or more or less the bulk of my collection. I got uh, records dating back from mm, from the early 30s. You know what I'm saying? Got some uh, vintage hip hop. Even got a little Chuck Berry right there. <laughs> Chucky baby. Yeah. I got three or four hundred thousand altogether. I have in the house doubles of a lot of things. You know, rare cuts and some garbage. <laughs> I know so many breaks, man. I mean, I'm a, I'm a walking encyclopedia when, when it comes to breaks, you know what I'm saying? Hip hop, in the hip hop world, they don't get too much by me. You know, I know it all. I know it all and never sleep. Yeah, classic, Planet Rock. One particular thing that I remember was going to see Africa Bambata Planet Rock. And Jazzy J was so funky, it was great. Moving from one break to the next, cutting two records together, it was just wonderful. And Bambata would be, you know, looking at the crowd, you know, being the sort of inscrutable master of records. Sam would feed me the records and I'd just go off. Once I get into a zone, it's like you can't even talk to me. I start hopping back and forth. At one point, took out a 45 slips it over Jazzy J's shoulder. You know, Jazzy J kind of looks up and takes it. Bam would point to the line, play the second cut. Play the second cut, the break is right there. Puts on the 45, and this break comes to the end, and then voop, 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 boom, and he lets it go. And I was, you know, I was sitting there, I was like, wait a minute, what? And it was, it was the opening break from the Shirley Ellis record, the clapping song, which I think the last time I heard that, I was nine. And I really liked it when I was nine. And all of a sudden, everybody's dancing to this funky break. And I thought, that's fucking amazing. Africa Bambata, master of records. Amongst all these records of shit that's probably here, you know, like your Lawrence Welk and, I don't know, Earth, Wind & Fire's not really shit, and Rolling Stones, all these records that you're gonna have here, there might be that one diamond in the rough, like, that's really a rockin' beat. When you find that one that, that you know you were the only one that found, you just kinda, 
remember, okay, this is what it was all about. You can be digging for breaks or vocal samples or bass lines or weird children's records or whatever, but it's the whole art of building up an arsenal so when you do go to a party, you're different from the next guy. My friend T. Ray, he tells me these stories like, yo, cut, he's from the South. Uh, he's from South Carolina. He's like, yo, cut, you know, I could go into a town and just, I, I could just smell the records. It's like, I'll, I pull in and I, oh, honey, we got to stop. There's some records in this town, you know? <laughs> you're digging all day when you find that one record, ah, oh, you know, it's at the end of the crate, you're dusty, you stink, you know? And it's, it's a whole culture. I mean, it's that whole, like, you got it on vinyl? You got two copies on vinyl? It's like that always thing you're asking. It's like your drug. You, you get it? You got that? It just happened to me when I went to North Carolina. Okay, just look in the yellow pages under R for records, and we'll find stores. Phone pages ripped out. Somebody got there before us looking for records. I talked to T Ray, and he was just like, oh, yeah, man. Oh, no, you, you won't be able to find a phone book with records, you know, uh, listed in there, because I tore them all out already. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, man. DJ Shadow, he's the king of digging. No one's iller than him. He's got a, a keen sense. He's got the spidey sense. He comes here regularly and spends the day usually going through the records downstairs. And he's been coming here for a long time. And he always comes up with a big stack of records like that. We don't let just anybody downstairs, so he does have a special relationship in that sense. This is just... It's my little nirvana. And uh, being a DJ that, that I take, you know, the art of digging seriously. And uh, this is just a place I've been going to for 11 years. It's just an incredible archive of, of music culture. And there's the promise in these stacks of finding something that you're going to use. And, and in fact, most of my first album was built off of records pulled from here. So it has almost a karmic element of like, you know, I was meant to find this on top, or I was meant to pull this out because it worked so well with this. So it's got a lot of meaning for me personally. Me and my, uh, my buddy Stan that I used to dig with, he was a graffiti writer. We used to come here just looking for things like, you know, incredible bongo band and stuff. Every now and then we'd buy things and, and Ed or Mark or someone will say, oh yeah, we got a ton of these in the basement or, uh, you know, oh, you should see the basement if you think this is something. So after like five years of hearing this, I just decided to just, can I just take a look? And uh, we came down here and uh, I couldn't believe that there was still something like this, a cache this large. And the fact that it's relatively untouched. Just being in here is a humbling experience to me because you're looking through all these records and it's sort of like a big pile of broken dreams in a way. Almost none of these artists still have a, a career, really. So you have to kind of respect that in a way. I mean, if you're making records and if you're a DJ and putting out, you know, releases, whether it's mixtapes or whatever, you're sort of adding to this pile whether you want to admit it or not. You know what I mean? Ten years down the line, you'll be in here. So keep that in mind when you start thinking like, oh yeah, I'm invincible and I'm the, I'm the world's best or whatever, because that's what all these cats thought. Over here is where uh, I was digging and there was a mummified bat under one of the records. That was nice. Watch your step here. You smell the gas? It smells like gas. I guess that's just the records. I honestly feel like the people that dig don't stop digging because it's a part of who we are. People that don't, you don't have to. It's not going to make a bad DJ good, but it'll make a good DJ better. We're going to do a song that you never heard before. Double D and Steins keep put out Lesson 3. And it was like a couple years after it came out, I heard it like in 86. And this was essentially like literally a lesson in all the old breaks being played by themselves from front to back in an order, a cohesive way that just, you know, it was groundbreaking. The torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans. 
Lesson three. It was a fusing of a lot of funk music and being able to take all these spoken word elements. And it became this increasing series of left turns where all of a sudden it was like, oh yeah, right, man, great. This is like we can put Humphrey Bogart over this and I have this seance record that we can use. When I heard that, that was, I mean, over the years, I always kept referencing that track. So when it came time for me to make my first record, I called it Lesson Four. And just so happened that a few hundred miles away, Cut Chemist was doing the same thing for the same reasons. Lesson Two. That was the first time I've ever heard breaks, um, old records with drum beats on them. I listened to it and I was like, wow, this record was made entirely from records. And I just went bananas. I said, this is it, this is the missing piece, you know, for to hip hop for me. So it's sort of like a once in a lifetime thrill for us because we flew in Steinsky to join us on stage for a lessons kind of reprise. We're trying to use all the original records. I'm like a radio DJ, you know, as the first record ends, the next record begins. And these guys real you know they knew that that these were studio creations and they kind of looked at them as oh yes this should be able to happen live which is amazing to me because we never even thought about that <laughs> A lot of the groups that I was brought up on, from the Commodores to the Earth, Wind & Fire to Al Green, Curtis Mayfield, all that, the sounds that they did back then, they don't do them like that no more. They started getting into the computer generation and newer equipment, and, and that style died, and, and the funk was, just didn't sound rugged like it used to. It's something about that, just that beat, man. It, 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 it's, it, it moves you in a certain way before you even hear vocals. It, it, it's, it's, it's a driving force. Premier embodies the best possible combination of an innovator in the DJ realm and an innovator in the production realm. You could tell he was a DJ first, got good at that, and then started making his own beats and just utilized records in every possible way. And the artists I work with, I always kind of hear the song before I do it. And what it is is when I start looking for samples or sounds on, other, on old records or whatever, I'm trying to find that sound that I heard in my head. And until it sounds like what I'm looking for, if I gotta search for a month until it sounds like what I'm looking for, that's how long it's gonna take. When Guru heard me do my demos and, and, and put me in, into Gangstar, I knew that I, I, should, I don't deserve 50% of the money if I just DJ. I gotta do something else. That's why I started saying, let me learn how to do beats. And then I'm putting my 50% into the group. I feel like if you're a DJ, you should know how to produce tracks because we rearrange tracks and remix tracks just from having records around. So if you can do it at a party or make mixtapes, you should be able to do, you know, hot tracks. What's up, California? What the fuck's going on, California? Yeah, that's my man, DJ Premier. I am the guru. We are gangsters. For example, young niggas want rap in the life they're living. You, you can't, can't ask them. It starts with the young ones doing proper fun. If you ain't down, you, you can, can play it out, son. So let's get a call. You know what? Fly well, I never wanted to be an MC. I rock the mic when I'm on stage, and I command the crowd, and I do all that because I learned from the old school and how they get a crowd to cooperate. It's a certain way you have to talk to them. I can say, come on, everybody, let's get your hands up. They ain't going to sit there, but if you say it to them like, yo, you know, blah, 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 and you kick it to them with the proper attitude, they're going to want to get down with you. They might say that we're a menace to society, but at the same time, I say, why, why is it me? Am I the target what? for destruction? What about the system? A total corruption. I can't work at no fast food joint. I got some talent, well, son, so don't you get my, my point? point? I'll organize my niggas and get crazy. Look, selling D -R -U -G -S. If I chose to be an MC, believe me, I'd probably have to go through a lot more drama than I do as a DJ because of the fact that the MC is more vocal. So when you're speaking a, vo a voice like that and you're selling over 100,000 albums, you're touching so many people. They're taking what you're saying to them and they're hoping that you are what you talk. And I, always, I tell the guru every day, yo, let's be about everything we drop because we're going to get tested on it. If, we, if, if the people on the street don't test us on it, God's going to test us on it.
making your own vinyl is uh it adds a different level from when I was just playing other people's records and can just, you know, I kind of had to go with whatever their format was. I've got uh, this record that I put out that I made where it's nothing but guitar tones. And um, it's a whole octave. So you can play it like an instrument. Kind of evolved. People used to not like vinyl that was kind of set up for DJing because they thought it was cheating. But then I think music started to be made anyway, catered towards DJs. So records specifically for turntablists and battle DJs and that sort of thing started popping up. These are ultimate breaks and beats. You know that whole digging in the crates thing. These kind of like helped a lot of guys find those breaks that are just not around. This was an opportunity for them to just, like, have these. There are hundreds all over the place. This record contains seven different noises. Noise number one is the, the horn stab. <laughs> and then the numbers. I'm with the one, two, three. One, two, three, and then, and then the, the tweak tone. <laughs> and then the, the crash. go to Japan, you look on the billboards, someone's scratching, you look on the commercials, there's a DJ, the video games coming out of there have DJs on it, the clubs, every, everything is, is DJ oriented. It's everywhere. Everywhere you go, people are buying turntables, people are scratching. Just in the amount of DJs, I mean, it's thousands of new ones every day. Kids want turntables and a mixer when they graduate from high school. They don't want a car, they, you know, they want turntables and a mixer. I'm gonna read through the order one more time. So we're gonna start off with Will, DJ Spaz. Second, Daniel, DJ Froth. So after Daniel, we got Mike, DJ Tech, David, DJ Static. Then we're gonna do a set from the rappers. Show me what okay. records are put on them. So anyway, I think the most important thing is that you guys enjoy yourselves when you do it.
it's a good thing to do with kids because they can put a record on and they can feel like, all right, you know, I'm making music. And so, you know, they can just come on the first day and be successful. And they're nervous enough just in class doing it in front of other kids sometimes, you know, but doing it here, it's a huge room, you know, and even if they're all not standing right in front of the stage, there's a hundred people in the room. They're nervous. It's cool to be the one controlling the crowd, you know what I'm saying? All the kids around me in my class, they say, oh, guys, you gonna uh, DJ the next dance? I said, yeah, I'll be there. So we'll be dancing, scratching or playing music or whatever. So it's cool. You know what I'm saying? We rappers, but we be doing a little DJ. You see the little shirt right here. So DJ, they cool because, you know, a lot of guys like it. You know, they be bumping in the cars and stuff like that. It's, it's the whole hip-hop thing. Yeah, it's the whole hip-hop thing. Everything has to do with hip-hop, we like. Do you like scratching? Scratching? Yeah, what is it? that uh, in England, in the last few years, that uh, turntables are outselling guitars. There's no doubt about it that the DJ industry has doubled in size in the last year alone and has captured the uh, American youth in the same style that youth were playing guitars and drums back in the 60s. The turntablist guys have really made a big splash. Their competitions like Disco Mix Club, ITF, have really fueled innovation. You have people like, like Q-Bark and Rock Raider, Mixmaster Mike. It's definitely booming. Hip-hop has been wonderful to us as a company. When they have a demonstration, you know, it's just the area is packed. You know, it's people standing all over the place. We've had some legendary guitar players, we get 10 or 12 people, you know. I spent all this time with Shane to learn all these, like, licks and everything, you know, musical theory and everything, and these guys come along, you know, scratching up the place. I've tried out myself, but I didn't know what they're doing. They could do some really neat stuff with it. But I guess, honestly, I hope it doesn't become another one instrument out there. I don't know, that'd just be a letdown. The turntable can entertain you for a while, but if you are only entertained that way, then you are eventually going to be dull. Kind of a silly way of making a, a noise that's not too pleasant to ears. Without musical instrumentation, what do they have to scratch? What are they going to do when electricity runs out? They're stuck with acoustic guitars. <laughs> I don't know. Let's get a record. Regular record. Any record will work. Have your little vinyl killer van. If you could see uh, myself, shortcut, keyword here, riding the van. Put the needle on. Turn on the van. Get ready for a lot of fun and excitement. Now, let's start. <laughs> Well, 
after the 60s sort of identified it with the whole Grateful Dead culture, I think we're in completely a new culture right now, which I feel that the Invisible Scratch Pickles initiated. And now, with a lot of the other crews around the Bay Area, you have a whole new energy source. For Filipinos, or American Filipinos at least, we don't really have role models, you know, as far as mass media goes. You know, there's no athletes, there's no actors. You know, we have our parents and Qbert. And, you know, whether Q likes or dislikes the idea, he's very much a role model. And you see it, you know, even the Australian DJ champs are a couple Filipino guys, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's more than a coincidence, you know, and I really attribute it to Qbert and, and Mike and Apollo, like, putting the DJing out there so much. Visible Scratch Pickles presence, you just kind of go, uh oh Because, you know, I mean, they're the most influential DJs that have ever lived. Let's go. They're disbanding as the Invisible Scratch Pickles. They're not going to use that name anymore. And the more going to sort of just do like solo things. And it's like the Sex Pistols. They, it was like they broke up at the peak. It was perfect. Yeah. Our Operation IV, the day their album came out, they broke up. I'm waiting for the DJ PlayStation game. You got your Burger King DJ, you know what I mean? You got your fucking... Uh, you got your L L.A. gel commercials with some fucking DJ. What the fuck is that? What does a turntable have to do with your hair? Same shit that happened to breakdancing is going to happen to DJing, too. You know what I mean? The true motherfuckers will survive and still be doing it 20 years from now. And then there will be all those fools that ju jump on it for, you know, for the trend of it. That's the whole thing. We got so kind of tired of the MCs. Fuck you guys, you know? We're going to do our own thing. But now we're kind of screwing ourselves because we're almost kind of doing what the, the MCs were doing. We're taking this DJ thing and no one's pushing the boundaries and everyone gets up there and they just do their little da 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 and they go to the next guy and he does his little deal. No one's throwing in any originality and we're just kind of getting typecast into this, oh, that's turntablism or that's turntable music. I know the boundaries of that. I know where that's gone. You got all these new kids, they got like 10 records and they're just battle records. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's, that's their collection forever. And they, they think know, that's... Else. When that record wears out, they go and buy it again. Like a lot of scratch DJs and... and uh, DJs that are like battle DJs don't know the first thing about digging for records and how to rock a party, you know, how to get on the mic. It's really important to get on the mic and speak to the crowd. People should make music to make people want to party and not just like make music for people to study, you know, it should make you want to party and shake your ass and like yeah, why does that get some be girls studied? on the dance floor. You know? why, is it, why does it gotta be studied? I want it back, I want it dirty, I want it crunchy, I want it raw, I want it ghetto. To most of the world, you know, this whole culture and this thing is maybe 20 years old, you know what I mean, At, if that. And uh, we're just on the brink of something new. And and I just know right now, it doesn't really bother me because I just know, I look at the kids who are into it now, and they're obsessed like I am. And, and I, I see them not quitting anytime soon. And I just can't imagine what it's going to be like when, when they're the older ones, when, when they're making decisions, when, they, when they're going to say what's cool, what sells, what is fine music, what is not. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an experimental record. It's an experimental for me, and I hope it be experimental for you. There's always been a mystery about the drum. The, the drum, the, the drum, the drum, the drum, the, the drum, drum, the, the drum, the, the drum, 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 the, the drum, the, the drum, 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 the, the drum, the drum, the drum, the drum, the drum, the drum. The drum. Improvising. We've got our turntables, we've got a crowd, and the collective goal of making the crowd rock. There's DJs at a rock a party, and, and and there's DJs who can really cut well. But what we try to do with the future primitive is bring those worlds together. The party rocker, the guy who collects deep breaks, the producer-minded individual, people who are like in there digging nonstop. That's the backbone, like in a jazz band, that's the drummer. And then you have the soloist, the turntablist, the, the scratcher, taking you on those abstractions.
I've always thought that anything that flows, you can find parallels to and merge. The exciting thing about hip hop is it was already doing that originally, you know, the four elements, break dancing, DJing, graffiti, and MCing. They're trying to marry a lot of different styles and a lot of different flows. Like with Doge, he paints behind it. That, that same fluidity in the way he paints and what's happening in the mix, there's definitely a parallel there. When I'm painting to a DJ in a club, the DJ talks to me, I talk to the audience. Hip hop is the lifeblood of my work, and turntablism is the next step, and it and it coincides with the audiovisual package of Future Primitive. The DJ gets the the B boys going, you know what I'm saying? The breaks and whatnot. They've always been the architects, the foundation of of the dance, the art, the MC. They're the conductors. They're the ones who lead you to where you want to go. Rhythm is really important. It's like a, if you want to reach that spiritual kind of medium in, in your soul. It's like it's like the Indians when they when they wanted to speak to the gods and stuff. Uh, they would have like a, a rain dances, and that would be with the drums. You know, and af after a while, the drums just get hypnotic and stuff, and just, they they go into a trance. And so music is trance inducing, like hypnotic, gets you in that spiritual state. You know, you just totally just, you just all into it. You know, you just, you just, just getting the whole. It's like you're not, you're not playing the instrument. It's like you're the instrument, and the universe is playing you. It's some kung fu stuff. I don't know. It's just you're just in there, and you, you don't feel it. You're just flowing. Nothing can stop you. Every, everything is one whole big ball of energy, kind of like the Star Wars thing about the Force. You know, everything is just, everyone's connected, you know, and we're all just like one energy. Like, we think we're separated, but everyone affects everyone. When you find out you're not separated, it's like, say, um, say like a, everyone is a, a limb of a one whole thing. So why would you want to hurt your hand or hurt your fingers or hurt your arms when you know that that person is part of you? So in order to help people, I make music for them and, you know, teach people about scratching and, and, and I guess, try to brighten up their lives or whatever, you know, that's my whole destiny on this earth. 
Cubert and Mixed Master Mike, and they all tell me, hey man, when we saw you, that was it. We, you know, and I know that I've affected the population of the planet Earth. That's a great film. I feel that people today are realizing that what they're doing now came from somewhere. In order for it to go any further, it has to go around the 360 in order for it to go even further. And I always say, you have to know where hip hop's been in order to know where it's going. You have to, you have to. Well, I always know things goes into cycles and it's all coming together. I just hope to see it be intergalactic. Since we are becoming galactic humans, you know, we're trying to get to Mars and Jupiter and all that, so I'm ready to see it on all the other planets in our solar system. Not the nine planets, but the 12 or 13 that's out there. That's what I'd like to do with turntables. Show the world that, you know, there's, some, there's something really cool out there, you know? Something different. Time somebody does a scratch, they should give me a dollar, you know? <laughs> you know? You know? You know? I really feel that. Thank <laughs> you. 